Hello, and welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the R Program using Scala. We continue talking about stacks and queues, uh, but we're going to take another little detour, and we're going to look at unit tests and how we can use JUnit. So in the last video, we got to the point where we had written an implementation of an array-based stack. Oh, uh, we'll go ahead and erase our text for our little stack here. And I, you know, in some ways proclaimed that yes, this will work reasonably well and looks up unless you make it too big. However, let's be honest, we really don't know if something works until we have tested it. The way that we would have tested this in the past would have been to write a companion object and put inside of that companion object a main and we could run it. And while that will work, it's really not the ideal way of doing testing. When you get into a professional software development environment, you, you need to rely on tests a lot to make sure that things are going well. And uh, tests come in different, in different, I guess, styles. The one that I want to talk about now are what are called unit tests. And a unit test is for exactly this type of situation. I have a small unit of code here, this one class, and I want to see if it works. And so I have these methods and I have some well-defined behaviors for them. And I want to write a set of tests to see if this does what it's supposed to. So there are some different frameworks for doing unit testing. The one that I use, uh, the book introduces it, and, and I'm going to use it here in these videos, is JUnit. Now technically JUnit is a Java testing framework. There are testing frameworks for that are specifically for Scala. There are you know, things like uh, Scala test. Uh, the reason I am choosing not to use those is in some ways, you know, this this uh, these videos, the textbook, the class that I teach my students isn't just supposed to be about Scala. JUnit works just as well. You're probably equally likely to find JUnit, or you're actually much more likely to find JUnit later in in a career. Um, and I feel like it's a bit easier to to get hold of. Uh, if you're taking this as a class from someone else, they might choose to use a different unit, te unit testing framework, and that is perfectly fine. I just wanted to go with JUnit. So you can go to JUnit.org. Note this is not www.JUnit.org. If you do that, it will take you to a place that doesn't really work. Uh, and you can download and install, which will take you to their GitHub page. And the way we're going to do this is plain old jar. So I am going to click on these jar files. Well, isn't that interesting? Okay, and I want to take the JUnit jar file from the repository that is not I really don't care about that. Okay. Um, JUnit 4.11.jar here. I don't need the sources. I don't need the Java docs. I just want the jar file. So if I click on that, it asks me, do I want to keep this file? And yes, indeed, I do. Now I need to move that file into the right location. I and mean, technically I could take it from wherever it is, but it's in my downloads directory. I really don't want to leave it in my downloads directory. So I will CD into my workspace for the book, and then I'm going to move the downloads file of that J unit to there. Uh, they also wanted me on this page up here to download the hamcrest core dot jar. Uh, could feel free to to do this and I can move it as well. Keep Okay. So now I have these files and they are in my workspace. They could be, like I said, wherever. You just want them someplace that you're not going to clear out 
or, or delete. And what I want to do is go to Eclipse and I need to associate those with this project. I need to make it so this project will see them. So we right click on our project and I'm going to go to build path here and I'm going to say configure build path under libraries I am going to add an external jar file we go into the workspace and I'll pick JUnit and because I downloaded it, I guess I'll do the Hamcrest as well. My guess is that everything I'm going to do here would work just fine without that. And so now uh, I have these additional libraries, my reference libraries here that are associated with this. Uh, we don't really need to look through them, but they're now in there so that when I do something that uses JUnit, that will be available. Okay, so under my source, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new package. And I'm going to call this package test. And all of my unit tests I'm going to put underneath there. And I'm actually going to make a kind of uh, another structure that's symmetric to what I have now. I'll make another new package. Sorry, you couldn't see that menu there. Of, of name test dot uh, ADT. Okay, so we have an ADT here. I want to put my testing of the ADT in there. And so now I will make a new Scala class. And I will call it test array stack. Okay. So I have my test array stack here. And I want to put in some tests, some unit tests in here. What I do is I'm going to define a function and I want to give these things names that indicate what they're testing. And when you're doing unit tests, you actually write a whole bunch of separate individual tests and each one is supposed to be very simple. It's supposed to test one thing and one thing only. So for example here, the thing that I might want to, to test, like the simplest thing that I could have for a stack is I want to make sure that when I create a stack, it's empty. Okay, so let's go with uh, I make a new stack, and for testing purposes, I'm going to make this a stack of ints. I need to import that my ADT's array stack not theirs. And now I need to check that it's empty. Okay, so I am going to assert true that stack dot is empty. Okay, control shift O. Let's see if it will find that for me because otherwise we get to find this inside of the J units. Uh, and it's not Okay, so I just did a little, um, I want the org.junit.assert and if I actually import everything that's under that, we're good. The other thing I need to do is I need to tell it that this method here is running a test. And for that, I'm going to use, the way that junit4 works is it uses annotations. And so I want the org junit test, uh, save, and what this says, okay, so I have this imported, the org junit test, which is an annotation, it imported all of the different assert methods, there's an assert true, an assert false, and assert equals, um, and we'll see some of those as we go, because I'll need those to do further testing. We put our test annotation on a method, and then we have the code inside of it. And each one of these is supposed to test some small little piece. Okay, they're not supposed to. Uh, you want it so that it's kind of one step at a time. 
Now if I right click on this and I do a run as, hopefully this will pop up on the video, indeed, I have a new way to run this. This says I can run it as a Scala unit test. And so when I click there, it runs and it pulls this up and you'll see there's this green bar. Okay, so the way that your the test frameworks like JUnit typically work is you either get a green bar or a red bar. Okay, green bar means all the tests are good. Red bar means tests went bad. Um, and the, the advantage of doing unit tests uh, is that you can write a whole bunch of tests for a lot of different things and then as you edit your code you can tell the your you can tell the the program to your IDE like Eclipse to run all of your unit tests okay? and so in the in the terminology that's used in agile development techniques this gives you courage okay? a lot of people are very afraid to change their code they're afraid that if they change something they're going to break it and and make it so it doesn't work and in some ways that is a valid fear so you need to have something that gives you courage. You need to have something that, that helps you know that when you make a change, you will be able to quickly and easily check that everything still works. And that's what a broad set of unit tests can do for you. Okay. So what would be another thing that we should test here? Well, I think that I should test uh, non-empty after push. Okay. Once again, simple little test. I'll copy this, but I'm going to add a line here, stack dot push of five. And then let's assert false. If I run this, now you'll see it ran two tests and they both pass. Okay, so 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 far so good. Uh, what else could we test inside here. Now one thing you might notice is I'm doing this whole line of making a stack over and over and over before, uh, again and it might be nice to not have this occur in every single test but every single test in here is going to need a stack. So one of the things that I can do is I can declare var stack as an array stack event but it's going to start off as null. And then because there is, this is something I want to have happen for every single test before the test is I want to make a new stack. Well, there's another annotation called at before and def, we'll call this make stack. And I want to do that. Now I need to import that. Actually, how about I just put an underscore there and we'll bring in all the things from JUnit as well as from JUnit assert. So now I make my stack here to make sure I didn't break anything. If I rerun the tests, we still got two tests run uh, and it passed them both, but I don't have to make my stack at the beginning of every one of these. Since there's an at before, you might guess there's also an at after. What's our next test up? test def push pop I don't know three so I want to push three elements on and pop them off stack dot push five copy paste paste two seven we'll go some prime numbers here and then I am going to assert equals I don't really care which one I pull up First, you are, as the variable name tells you, you're supposed to give it the expected value. The first thing that I pop off, I expect to be seven. And the expression that I am testing is stack.pop of seven. Okay. And why are you unhappy with me? Oh, never mind. Duh. <laughs> it's just stack.pop. I'm not supposed to tell it there's a seven. <laughs> okay, copy, paste, paste. The next pop should pull off the two and the next one should pull off the five. And we go and look, hey, now I have three tests that are passed and I'm on a green bar. So, so far I'm feeling pretty good about this. I've managed to make sure that my is empty works um, both with and without. Hey, you know, if I wanted to, I could also put in an assert true stack dot is empty. 
I have a funny feeling some unit test purists might disagree with this, but I think this is part of the functionality for for pushing and popping three things. It should be empty at the end. Uh, okay, um, let's push this a little bit further. Write another test, def push pop 100. Okay, so as the name implies, I am going to push 100 items onto here, and then I'm going to pop them all off. And that might, at that point, bother you, uh, because you probably don't want to watch me cut and paste 100 different lines and put in 100 different ints, and indeed I'm not going to. Now, most of the time, your unit tests should be something simple like this. You don't want to put any complex logic in your unit tests in general, because as soon as you do that, you know the whole purpose of the unit test is to make sure your code is right. If you put complex logic inside of your unit test, how do you know your unit test is right? However, to scale this up, I, I know it turns out this test is going to break our code, but the I don't want to hand code push pop 100. Okay, so what I'm actually going to do is I am going to create an array that has 100 elements in it. They will be randomly generated numbers pulled from 0 to 999. And I'm going to run through and push them all on. Okay, so that pushes them all off onto the stack. Now I need to make sure that I can pop them all off and I get them in reverse order. So what I'm going to do here is, I guess I'll use a for loop for this one instead of the for each, for in, in nums dot, why is that giving that to me in capital letters? Anyway, so we will, Pull, run back through the numbers in reverse order because that's how they're supposed to come off the stack. And for each one, I want to assert equals. The thing that I am expecting to get is in, and the thing that I am testing is stack dot pop. So now I run my test. Oops, I have an error up here. Where is this? Oh, yeah. Apparently I decided to import that when I did the completion. Okay, so now I run four tests, red bar. Okay, so what went wrong here? Well, if I expand this up a little bit, we'll see, I still have three tests that passed, but the push pop 100 failed, and it says array index out of bounds exception on 10, and this is what we were expecting. Okay, as soon as I push that 11th item onto here, the push, tries to access sub 10, which isn't valid, and we have a problem. Okay, so in some ways I'm happy. I've actually written sufficient testing at this point. This is not really complete enough testing. There are more tests that I could and should do on my stack, but I've gone far enough at least to uncover an error. So I'm gonna stop the video here, and we're gonna come back next time, and we're gonna fix this error. Okay. So I'll see you again shortly.